ready for the event. JSC PAO, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Johnson PAO. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, good morning, Scott. This is Mark Corot from Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, I'd like to ask you, what would you like the legacy of the flight that you and Mikhail are about to wrap up? What would you like the legacy of that to be for us back on Earth? Good to hear from you, Mark. Um, you know, I'd like to for the legacy of this flight to be that we can uh, decide to do hard things and hard things that will take us further away from the earth and this is one of them and uh, you know I'm, I'm hopeful and I think uh, we'll learn a lot about longer duration space flight and, uh, and how that will take us to Mars someday so I'd like to think that this is a, another of many stepping stones to us landing on Mars sometime in our future. Hey Scott, Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica Hope you're doing well. Um, it, you've been up there for almost a year now. I'm wondering if you maybe could reflect a little bit on Valery Polyakov and uh, kind of, you know, now that you've been up there for so long, and, and are you ready to go another 100 days? So, um, you know, I think it's a little bit of a, a different experience being on, on this space station versus Mir. We have, uh, uh, you know, better connectivity with people on the ground um, you know I think the environment is a little bit more comfortable um, and so you know I really respect what he did back then uh, obviously and uh, yeah I could go another hundred days I could go an another year if I had to it would just depend on on what I was doing and if it uh, if it made sense although I do look forward to getting home here next week Hi, Scott. Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, now you're getting ready to go home. Have you packed a specific item for yourself as a memento of a year in space? Or if not, is there something that you wish you could bring home from the space station as your souvenir? You know, I don't look at uh, souvenirs that have flown in space the same that other people do only because you know I've been in space so many times so I don't put the same sentimental value on on those kind of things as other people do and I absolutely understand why other other people do um, you know and I respect that but the fact that I've been here you know four times and for you know well over 500 days it doesn't have the same meaning to me um, so I really don't have anything personal for myself that I've flown. Uh, I have a stuff that other people have given me and I look forward to returning those items to them when I get back. Hey Scott, this is Jake Reiner with KPRC Channel 2. For those of us that have never been in space, can you kind of put, in, put into words what this experience has been like for you and how can you com compare life in space to life on Earth? You know, it's a, uh, you know, the space station here is a, a magical place. It's uh, uh, an incredible science facility we have. Uh, it's a privilege to to fly here, and it's something that I hope uh, more people will have the opportunity uh, to do in the future. And I, you know, I think we will. Um, it's just a matter of it's just a matter of time. Um, I, I'm not sure if you had another part to your question to people that have never been in space what what is what is it what is it what is it like if you could compare it to everyday life we have here on planet earth you know it's somewhat of a harsh environment uh you know you never even after you know i've been here nearly a year you don't feel perfectly normal you know there's always uh you know a lingering something you feel or you know, it's just not not normal. Having said that, it's not necessarily uncomfortable, but it is a harsh environment. You know, for instance, having no running water. You know, it's kind of like I've, I've been in the woods camping for a year with regards to, like, hygiene. And, you know, it's even more complicated here. And then the fact that everything floats makes your, you know, daily life just just more difficult. 
Station, this is Houston at ACR. That concludes the JSCPAO portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from KSC. Station, this is KSCPAO. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear. Uh, Scott, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, I'd like to know, what's taken the greatest toll on you during the past year, do you think, and how might that bear on a future Mars mission? You know, I, Marcia, I think, you know, physically, I, I feel pretty good, and that's, you know, very, you know, kind of a subjective uh, data point. Um, you know, certainly when we look at the data, you know, there might be, um, you know, effects that uh, are more significant than, than, you know, how I feel. Um, but I think the, you know, the hardest part is is being isolated, uh, you know, in a physical sense from from people on the ground that are important to you, and uh, you know, it's, you know, the personal. I don't know if I'd necessarily call it a, a, the psychological aspect, but there's certainly, you know, a loss of connection with uh, uh, folks on the ground that you, you care for and love and, you know, want to spend time with that I think uh, is is a challenge. Obviously, going to Mars, there are a lot of other challenges, but, you know, none of these we can't overcome. Hi, Scott. Bill Harwood, CBS News. Uh, just kind of following up on that and... You mentioned yesterday about, you know, you're coming to the, the end of a very long mission. You didn't think it'd be a problem going to Mars, you know, if you can, con you know, conquer the technical aspects of that. But when you get back and debrief, what can you think of that would make life better for a long-duration crew member on the way to Mars, for example, or even on the station uh, that maybe you didn't have? Or are there any things that could be done in how things are carried out on the station that would make the life better on a long-duration flight for you guys? You know... On a trip to Mars, we're not going to have this much space, obviously. You're going to be in much uh, tighter quarters. Uh, you're going to, you know, you're going to live. You're going to use the restroom. You're going to exercise all within, you know, a few square meters of one another, I assume. You know, that's probably, you know, it's not going to be like the science fiction spaceship going to Mars. It's going to be something much more smaller. And even though our crew quarters and our, our privacy is uh, is pretty good, and what we have here is pretty good, I think it's going to have to be a lot, lot better. You know, I've spent in the CQ I'm looking at, the crew quarters here, probably almost half the time I've been here between sleeping and, and working on the computer, I've spent in a, basically a box the size of a, a phone booth. So making that, you know, that private, uh, that private area as perfect as possible, I think it will go a long way towards, you know, reducing fatigue, reducing stress, and, uh, you know, helping for a, a successful mission from, from I think the, uh, you know, the aspect you're you're asking. Hey, Scott, Phil Keating, Fox News. Um, interviewed you and your brother back in uh, February in Houston. Uh, it's been a big year. Biggest uh, priority of the experiment is seeing how the effects of long-term duration in space could make more likely or less likely a trip to far destinations like Mars. So uh, based on how you feel physically and mentally, psychologically, uh, what makes you think this is not just a pipe dream for us to send Earthlings to Mars, but it, it's definitely something we can do. You know, when I look at this space station and what we've done here, um, building it by many different nations using different, uh, you know, different standards of, of measurement, uh, in some cases, uh, different languages, putting this space station together that's uh, over a million pounds the size of a football field while flying around the earth at 17,500 miles an hour and then keeping it occupied for the last 15 years I think there's nothing we can't uh, accomplish uh, that we don't uh, you know put our mind and our minds and our resources behind so you know that you know after being here for so long that's one thing I definitely realize that you know if we can if we can dream it you know, we can do it if we if we really want to. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KSC portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from JSC PAO. 
Station, this is JSCPAO. How do you hear me now? Uh, loud and clear. Okay, we're now going to take questions from the phone bridge. So phone bridge participants, please press star one if you have a question, and then star two to withdraw your question if it's been answered. We'll start with Jeff Brumfield from National Public Radio. I'm wondering if you had had any noticeable specific effects on your health, and that could be either physical or psychological, like depression. And then the second part is, where's the first place you're going to go when you get back to Houston? Um, you know, the subjective stuff, you know, I have a little bit of, I, I think, uh, you know, effect on my vision that was is very consistent with what I experienced last time. From a psychological perspective, even though I really, you know, look forward to going home, it's not like I'm climbing the walls. I think even on my last flight that was 159 days, I was much more ready to, to come home. Um, and I think that had probably had a lot to do with the fact that my sister-in-law, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, was shot two months prior. Um, so, you know, there there are the things I, I, I feel, and, and I feel... I feel pretty good. Um, and as far as what are the first things I'm going to do, when I get back to Houston, I'll go to the astronaut crew quarters at the Johnson Space Center for several hours of medical tests that end at about 3 in the morning. Um, and then I'm going to go home and jump in my pool. Okay, next we'll hear from Miriam Kramer with Mashable.com. Hi, Scott. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, and this question is in no way meaning to at all belittle what has been a historic and extraordinary flight. Uh, but I'm just curious, is there some part of you that is slightly disappointed that you aren't up there for a full 365 days, that you're coming back on day 340? Uh, and thanks so much. Um, you know, I really don't think about that kind of stuff um yeah you know for me if i you know launched in march and land in march that's pretty close to a year um so no i'm not slightly disappointed at all actually it's actually something i haven't really considered next we'll hear from tracy watson with usa today Okay, next, let's try Trevor Hughes from USA Today. Good morning, sir. You've taken a lot of very beautiful photos of the Earth over the, the past year. What's been your favorite memory or moment uh, in capturing our planet? Yeah, I've, I have taken a lot of pictures because I've been up here for a long time. I, actually, numbers-wise, I don't think I've taken, you know, that much compared to other uh, crew members we've had up here, but I've, uh, you know, I've definitely taken some some good ones um, and some memorable ones. You know, uh, Hurricane Patricia um, was pretty impressive. Uh, some of the aurora we saw, especially in the in the south during the uh, the summertime. Um, you know, the ba Bahamas always is always an impressive sight. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I think I just got a really good picture of Mount Everest, actually, like an oblique picture, but I'm kind of trying to confirm that it's actually Everest. But I think uh, people really enjoy looking at that, uh, which I haven't posted yet, but I took today. Okay, next up, Ann Ball from Voice of America. Hello. Thank you so much for um, talking to us today. I was wondering, um, there's the recent story about Apollo 10, and when they went on the dark side of the moon, they heard strange sounds. And I'm wondering if uh, you have heard any strange sounds or strange musics uh, that you could not identify while you've been up there. Um, not really. I mean, occasionally... 
with the uh, especially with the Russian comm system with their VHF system, you'll pick up signals uh, on the, from the ground, so you'll hear you know interference that obviously originates on Earth. I mean, we can hear airport ATIS information on that that uh, VHF comm system they have. So, you know, I suspect you know probably what they heard on the moon maybe was something that was uh, interference. Even though you say it was on the opposite side of the moon, maybe there was some kind of, uh, you know, transmission from the, you know, orbiting uh, spacecraft down to the guys on the surface that probably originated on Earth is my suspicion. Just a reminder to the foam bridge participants to press star one if you have a question and star two to withdraw your question if it's answered. Next, we'll go to Kenneth Chang from New York Times. Thank you. I was just wondering... Go ahead, Kenneth. Okay, maybe we've lost him. We'll try instead Jeremy Settle from News 12. News 12, New Jersey. I just want to say uh, you're making the people of New Jersey very proud to call you one of our own. And I just want to ask you, is there anything about your New Jersey upbringing that prepares you for life in space? You know, when I was a kid, I, I don't know if it's particular to New Jersey, but my brother and I had a, a certain sense of freedom that I think kids, at least, you know, my kids don't have with regards to what they're allowed to do and where they're allowed to, uh, you know, venture when you're at a very young age. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it's not that way, but, you know, we lived a pretty uh, exciting and uh, adventurous life. Um, very early on that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's it's because of New Jersey or just because of the times that I think, you know, probably contributed to my brother and I have a pretty, having a pretty adventurous uh, spirit. Okay, next question will be from Charles Akinson with examiner.com. Thank you, uh, Charles Axon Examiner. Commander Kelly, Will you stay on at NASA for Project Orion? And uh, how do you plan to contribute to America's upcoming missions away from low Earth orbit uh, in, in conjunction with your medical checks? You know, I will always uh, try to stay involved in the space program in, uh, you know, any capacity that will be allowed. It's, uh, you know, been my life my, the last 20 years. It's something I feel very strongly about. You know, there are times when you when you transition, you know, from from one thing to another. But uh, you know, this has been my life, and it's something I feel very strongly about, and want to be a uh, you know a big part of for the rest of my life. Next, let's hear from Jareen Iman with CNN. Okay, reminder that if your question's been answered, you can press star two to withdraw it. If you have a question, you can press star one. Uh, let's go instead to Jason Davis with the Planetary Society. Hi, Scott, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I was hoping you could describe the physical tests that you'll be going through immediately after returning to Earth um, and how those tests will be applicable to trips to Mars where an astronaut has, spends a lot of time in weightlessness and suddenly has to adapt to gravity without assistance. Thanks. Yeah, so right after we get out of the Soyuz, they'll put us in the chairs that people often see uh, sitting nearby the spacecraft. And then from there, we go into this medical tent. And once we're inside the medical tent, we'll be given a little bit of a time to adjust. But then we go through about an hour of uh, what's called this field test that is, uh, you know, various uh, different types of experiments. Some are physical, kind of like, you know, even an obstacle course where you, you know, run around obstacles and, you know, stand up from a sitting position and jump and stand and, you know, looks at our, uh, you know, our ability to, uh, you know, for our, our uh, you know, our physiology to, to adjust to those different positions and, uh so uh, it's pretty extensive stuff that we do for pretty soon after we get back. 
Okay, now we're going to try again with Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question was, did you notice any differences on the second six months compared to the first six months physically or psychologically? You know, it's it's interesting. When I when I look back on the time I've been here and think, you know, to the summer or even like, you know, the the fall September, it seems like it was so so long ago. And um but I don't know that there's been much of a difference. I, I've tried to take this, uh, do this with a very deliberate uh, methodology, deliberate pace, looking not really at the end, but what is the next milestone, you know, the next uh, visiting vehicle that's coming, the next uh, crew members that, that change out, the next major science uh, experiments we might uh, have, have going on like you know I'm looking at the microgravity science glove box here like the rodents you know that we did that that was a that was a very big milestone um, so and I think that's important I mean I think having those kind of milestones that break up uh, a very long duration flight is something that is critical and maybe something you know we're gonna have to think a lot about when we are going to Mars where you know the next milestone might be six months later when you're arriving on the planet or you know, six months later when you're coming home. So, um, but I don't look at the whole experience like a, the first six months, last six months. You know, I try uh, to almost only look to the next thing. And uh, fortunately, you know, we finished some, some major maintenance on our, our water system uh, just yesterday. And that was a, a, one of those big things, not a giant thing, but uh, something that was, I considered a milestone. And Next milestone's coming home. Okay, our next question is from Lindsay Lowe with Scholastic News. Hi. School, uh, what advice would, would you give to kids who want to travel to space someday? So, you know, the advice I give, and if you can mute your mic, the advice I give about... Um, you know, kids that want to travel in space. My assumption is they're talking about being a, a NASA astronaut, and we have certain minimum requirements, and and those are generally, a, you know, an expertise and a and a degree in some kind of technical field, and that's important. But what I also tell them, it's important to choose something that you like, uh, a field that you like, assuming it's qualifying, because if you like it, you're going to do better at it. And NASA looks for people that have done you know, a good job in their, you know, whatever field they were working in. Um, and then also people that are that, that are pretty well-rounded, not just focused in one specific area, because up here, you're really a generalist. I mean, you're everything from the medical doctor to the space walker to the, you know, to the plumber, to the electrician, to the scientist, uh, to the pilot in some cases. Um, so it's uh, it's good to be very well-rounded. Okay, now we're going to go back to Jereen Emin with CNN. Um, you made a few comments about our planet's atmosphere while you're up in space. Um, since spending so much time up there, has it changed your outlook on the Earth's environment and its climate? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the more the more I look at Earth and certain parts of Earth, the more I feel, you know, more of an environmentalist and someone that uh you know would like to do do a better job at helping to protect it there are definitely areas where you know the earth is covered with pollution almost all the time and uh and you know it's not good for any of us and uh you know there are weather systems that i've seen while i was up here that were in places that were unexpected storms you know bigger than uh you know we've seen in the past so you know, I think there, and, and this is a human effect. Uh, you can tell that that is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's not clouds you're looking at. It is just a blanket of constant pollution in certain areas. So, you know, we can we can fix that if we, if we you know, put our minds to it. it. You know, we can do amazing things if we put our minds to it. And that's one of the things I've learned up here by living in this incredible facility for so long 
is that, you know, if we can, like I said earlier, you know, if we can dream it, we can, uh, you know, we can make it so. So, uh, you know, I hope to, to do more when I get home um, in helping protect Earth. One more reminder that if you have a question on the phone bridge, you can press star one. And if your question has been answered, press star two. Next question will be from Sarah Hammond with Arizona Public Media. Good morning. Um, you're one of the two subjects of the twin study. And from your perspective, Scott, what is the most important aspect of the study that will inform future long duration space travel? Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to pick one uh, one of the studies over over any of the others as far as their their importance. Um, that study is looking at a lot of important things um, between my brother and I and our physiology and how uh, it you know changes over time in the course of the time I'm here. You know, one part of it is kind of a new area that NASA is, uh, is getting into um, with this study is the effects of spaceflight on a genetic level. And uh, so that's something I'm pretty excited about, you know, for personal reasons, but also for the, uh, the, the research to, to try to have a better understanding how this uh, microgravity environment and the radiation environment affects us uh, genetically. Um, you know, there's a lot to learn, and uh, as we've seen over the last 10 years, you know, that that discipline of, of science has really just taken off, so it's great to see us uh, starting to focus on that in space as well. Next up is Candace Dold from WBFF. Scott, many of the headlines about you right now speak about your year in space, but 20 years down the road, what will make you the most proud about your career as an astronaut? You know, the thing I like most about flying in space is not, you know, the view or, you know, floating, um, you know, the other stuff that's fun about this, riding the rocket or, you know, coming back to Earth. The thing I like about it is doing something that I feel very, very strongly about, um, very passionate about, something that's very difficult. Uh, you know the work we do here every day is extremely uh, is extremely hard. It takes a lot of concentration. It's complicated, um, and you know we work hard at it, and I work hard at it. And you know I'm just going to be, you know, 20 years from now I'll think back, and I think I'll just be proud that I had a, a basically a you know 20 year or more year career here with four uh, very successful space flights that. Uh, you know, accomplished most of our mission objectives, and and it wasn't easy, and I worked hard at it, and and it, and it was a success. So it's really the whole the whole thing that uh, that I enjoy. Next question is from Joy Malbon with Canadian Television. Commander Kelly, um, you've spoken about some of the lovely pictures you've taken, and I'm wondering if the Northern Lights or anything over Canada impressed you. Oh, absolutely. I got some great uh, Northern Lights pictures over Canada. Um, yeah, I actually, you know, tweeted uh, several of them. And, uh, yeah, the Northern Lights are are amazing. Uh, actually, you know, as you may know, it's it's affected um, by the, the sun and our, our solar cycle. And, while I've been up here, the southern lights we've had have, have been really incredible as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful place. One more question from Bear Essential News for Kids. Hello, Scott. This is Stephen Jin with Bear Essential News. And my question is, um, you've taken a lot of breathtaking photos from your vantage point on ISS, how much of a privilege has this been for you, and at what age did you get into photography? Well, this is an incredible privilege to be able to uh, work for NASA and represent my country, our country, um, and I feel extremely fortunate uh, to 
you know, been given this responsibility to be able to do this. Um, as far as photography is concerned, uh, that's part of our job. You know, it's something that I really just started getting into when I became an astronaut. And, uh, you know, because we have such a great canvas with the Earth and such a, you know, a unique vantage point that they, you know, it's, you know, mandatory that we, we capture it and, and share it with the public. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.